There's so many ways to find a blessing in worship. That song we just sang, uh, Diana Brink had given me a book about some of the the stories of hymns. And in this one, uh, Charles Scriven, he was in Ireland. The day before his wedding, his uh, bride-to-be was swimming and drowned. And he was so distraught, he moved over to Canada. And years later, he was engaged again, and she contracted an illness and died And before they would be married. And he was just so moved by all this tragedy that he had a life of service. And he would chop wood, but he wouldn't sell it. He would give it to the poor and needy. And about ten years after the second death, his mom got sick over in Ireland, and uh, he had no money to go back. So he sent this poem to her, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. And what a blessing um, this uh, Joseph Scriven had just by writing that song, that poem, to his mom to comfort her when she was facing her own death. There are tremendous blessings for us in worship in every aspect. And in the Holy Scriptures, we have a very powerful message. The message that has the possibility of transforming our lives and helping us see life and see Jesus and see God in a different way. Now, when I was a kid, my my dad was a preacher in a big church. I sat in the back row of the balcony, in this big balcony up there, and, and he would be speaking away. And somehow, I don't know how, I got some wrong ideas about God. For example, my kind of idea as a kid was, uh, God is in judgment against you. Or God would be angry with you or upset with you. And as I look at the Scriptures, I see something different. And I also had the wrong idea of what a Christian looked like. I thought a Christian, as a kid now, would have to look Really, really pious. And for me, that would be a really hard thing to do. And, and then you had to just not do a lot of things. In my dad's church, uh, if you were an officer, an elder, or a deacon, well, you couldn't smoke, you couldn't drink, no dancing, no playing with playing cards, no gambling, no alcohol. And um, it wouldn't work in this church. My, my, it just wouldn't work. And, and so... It's just like I had the idea that things you didn't do made you a Christian. But look at what Jesus teaches us uh, in, in the account today. It's written by Dr. Luke, who was the physician to St. Paul. Paul had been beaten up so many times and stoned and left for dead and whipped that Dr. Luke went with him. I don't know what Dr. Luke did, but he was there. And he wrote an account to the Gentile Christians called the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts. And it's a, it's a wonderful gift. And I love this story because it's how um, Jesus interrupts a funeral. Oh, we have to picture this. The Bible story, as Luke tells us, is that Jesus is coming into a village, approaching it, and he has his 12 disciples and a big crowd behind him. They're all coming in, sort of like coming into Odin or something like this. You're coming in and coming out of the city is a widow, four guys carrying a pallet in which the widow's only son was laid out. They're on their way to the cemetery and it's a really troublesome picture because She's dressed in black, the widow, and they had no social security back then. The son was supposed to provide for mom. What's she going to do? So she has grief and fear for the future. Now, it's really important that we take a look at Jesus in this context. In the upper room where Jesus shared the bread and the cup, Philip says to him in John chapter 14, Show us the Father, Jesus will be satisfied. And Jesus says, you've been with me these three years, all this time, 
and you still don't know me? Now listen to what Jesus says. He who has seen me has seen the Father. Now as we look at Jesus, we're going to be seeing how the Father's like in heaven. God's like by looking at Jesus. And as Jesus comes along, he sees this procession coming out of the village of Nain. They're in Judea, uh, more to the south. The Sea of Galilee, the Galilean ministries to the north, where he did most of his work. But now he's in the Judean area to the south. And here comes the procession. And back then, they had a different sequence of things. It wasn't right, but this is what they did. They had the women in the front. And it was for a bad, bad reason. The reason they're in the front is that their theologian says, it's not our fault, or us guys, that there's death. It's Eve and the women's fault. Therefore, to remind them, we're letting them march up front. That's awful. That's terrible. It's, not, it's bad theology. But that's their custom was. So the women are there. And now there was a great crowd behind the women. Now, what this means was they liked the young man and they liked the widow. And they're upset and there's a big crowd gathering. And they're going out and Jesus. Now, what is God like? He's moved with compassion. And a sign of spirituality, a sign of the nature of God our Father and of Jesus is compassion. The more spiritual we become, the more we feel for other people. The more we care for other people. Passion is like to feel with them and come as with. Now, it could be celebrating with them for a wedding, like for Joni this weekend. And for others, it's the time of hardship or illness or gathering at Cardinal Glennon Hospital as, as we gathered around the little child that we were so scared about that had fallen and had, had, had internal bleeding in the head. It's just like, that's a scary thing. So there's compassion, there's caring. And Jesus has compassion. And now he's going to do something that stuns everyone. He walks up and he touches the palate. Now the movement stops. The procession stops, and Jesus has just made himself ceremonially unclean. You don't do that. Now you have to go through a washing ceremony in a case like this. He touches the pallet, and the guys carrying it stop. And the widow stops, and the women stop, and the crowd stops, and the disciples, the twelve disciples are going, Oh no, what's going to happen? This is not good news. And the crowd behind him, what is going to happen? What in the world is Jesus doing? Now, to understand this passage, we need to also go to the Hebrew Scriptures. And we go back to the two prophets, the greatest prophets of the Old Testament. Elijah and Elisha. Elijah, in one instance, raises a young child from the dead. Just one, a Phoenician, a, not a Jewish kid. And then Elisha also does the same thing, raises a child, a, a young kid from the dead, and also a Phoenician, not a Jew. And that was a mark of the great prophet. Now, Jesus, he touches the pallet there. They're carrying on their shoulders, and there's silence. And there's sometimes we need to be silent. There are sometimes we just need to stop in life. You know, some, there's a platitude. Stop and smell the roses. Stop and appreciate the nature. Stop and appreciate the corn beginning to come up. Stop and appreciate the beauty of the trees and the gardens and the flowers. Stop and uh, appreciate our friends. Stop and appreciate our family. Stop and appreciate the church family. Stop and, and just gather something here. And Jesus has them all stop. And then, and then he does something. The question is for us is, when we've been hurt in life, can we still go on 
or are we going to be broken? And years ago, Marjorie Smith, who was a wonderful person in our church family, her only daughter, their only child, was killed in an auto wreck in college. And what did she do? It could be something that could destroy us, or she carries on. And she carried herself on in service and caring, involved in the church, uh, involved with the food pantry, helping others. In other words, what faith is to do when we've been smashed down in life is to keep on going. And I like something that uh, Reverend Fred Rogers said. He was a Presbyterian minister in my alma mater, Pittsburgh Seminary, and uh, he did children's ministry with Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. And he says this, and this is book, The World According to Mr. Rogers. This is the kind of theology I read now. Um, he says this, Human relationships are primary in all of living. If you want to be happy, it's going to be found in human relationships. And if you want to be miserable, it's also found in human uh, relationships. Either way. And he says it's primary. Now, when the gusty winds blow and shake our lives, and all of us will be shaken at some point, when it shakes our lives, we may, if we know, now if we know that people care about us. In other words, you are cared for. You are loved. You, you really are. If you know that, and when the gusty winds hit, Fred says, we may bend with the wind, we're bending, but we won't break. Why? It's our church family, it's our family, it's our friends that stand with us, and we're bending, but we won't, we won't, won't break. Well, now Jesus does something here. He looks with compassion upon mom. And she has tears in her eyes. Her clothes are ripped. She has ashes on her face. She looks a fright. And there may be times when we're like that too. And I also want to share one other piece that we shared at the service, a celebration of Dennis Mann about James Freeman, Love is Stronger Than Death. And this little piece was written and shared in space. It was uh, done by Buzz Aldrin did this. And it was on the lunar module back in 1969, as I am there. And I just want to share part of this with you. And what he is, he's, his wife is dying, and he's so distraught. And he goes up to the tower, Unity Tower, to pray. And as he's praying all by himself up there, he hears a voice. Do you need me? I am there. You cannot see me, yet I am the light you see by. You cannot hear me. Yet I speak to your voice. You cannot feel me, yet I am the power at work in you. And it goes on and on saying, I am there. That's it. I'm there with you. And the point is, as we go through life, there's a spiritual presence besides our family and friends and church family. And that's Jesus. And Jesus, as he's there stopping the parade, stopping the ceremony, stopping the funeral, two great crowds, one behind him, one in front of him, he says something. Young man. The disciples are saying, who is he talking to? Young man. Now remember also, Jesus was a carpenter without the modern tools. He lifted stone and wood and sawed. He, had, he was really, really strong forearms. Really powerful, powerful hands. Young man. I say to you, arise. Now the crowd behind Jesus is going, what? And the other crowd, what's he doing? This is scandalous. Talking to the deceased, not even respectful. And there's the widow crying still. He told her, don't cry, stop crying. I don't think she could stop the tears. And he says, Get up! Get up! These guys are on the pallet. He's sitting up. And he begins to talk. I'm thinking he's saying, Mom, Mom, what's going on here? And what does Jesus do? He takes those strong arms, 
picks him off that pallet and gives him to his mother. Oh my goodness. Oh. Talk. I'm sure mom's just speechless. And we're all just touched. And what does the Bible say? A great fear comes on the people. The first reaction is fear. What is going on? It's fear. And then they see the love reunited. And they begin to praise God and say, A great prophet has come among us. Now, a great prophet like Elijah and Elisha. A great prophet. But they don't see him as the Messiah. They don't see him as a Christ yet. There's more to Jesus than we might see. The possibility is that Jesus is with us, He's for us, and He loves us. Well, I want this to give out a couple points here. Jesus seeks us out. She didn't seek Jesus out. Jesus seeks us out. And then Jesus restores us. He's in their restoration business. Once we're done, once we're touched and restored, we, we can't earn that love. We can just be in gratitude and serve. Well, there was a professor at Boston University. And I just love this story because he was from Columbus, Indiana, where my son lives. And he wrote an old song went like this. Are you able, says the Master, to be crucified with me? And yea, the sturdy dreamer's answer to the death will follow thee. He was the poet laureate of Indiana, professor at Boston. And he's at a concert in Indiana. And it's the Royal Welsh Singers. And they're doing back in 1919, 1920, all the ragtime music. And they had a great time. And the people were just so thrilled. And at the end of the concert, the professor is stunned. He is totally, totally shocked. Because they stop and they sing a hymn that was written by Reverend Henry Light. And... uh he was a pastor who got really sick. He couldn't breathe. The doctor said, you've got to go to Italy to live. And he's sitting by the English Channel before he leaves. And he writes a poem. It goes like this. Abide with me, fast falls the eventide. The darkness deepens, Lord, with me abide. When other helpers fail and comforts flee, help of the helpless, oh, abide with me. And that, when they... He got as far as southern France and they found that poem in his, his traveling chest and they put it to music and it became the number one hymn in England and Scotland for evening vespers. Abide with me. Why is this royal Welsh singer doing this? Why are they singing the song? And he asked them, why did you put one religious song in there? Well, it's the least we could do. That song saved our lives. Has a song ever saved your life? I mean, wow. And he says, what they were on, they were on the Lusitania ship. And in World War I, it was hit by the German submarine. It went down. Eleven or twelve hundred people died. And they were Welsh. They were good swimmers. And they knew it was risky. And this is what they said. Guys, what we're going to do, when that ship goes down, if we get hit, we're all going to jump off and swim away so when the ship goes down, it won't pull us down with it. And we'll swim out and um, we'll gather in a certain spot further out. And the ship hit. It sank quick. And they made it out there. And they're hanging on to some driftwood. And they're hanging on and hanging on. And many of the people who died died of herpo- hypothemia as well as drowning. In other words, the water's cold there off of Ireland, really cold. And it got dark and darker, and it was really bad. And there was, I can't hold on anymore. And there's the four of the quartet hanging on. Well, they missed us. The rescue people missed us. Before we die, it's okay to let go, but first we're going to sing one last song. And this is the song they chose. The second verse says, Swift to its close ebbs out life's little day. Earth's joys grow dim, glories pass away, change and decay, and all around I see. O oh, thou who changest not, abide with me. And the third verse, I need thy presence every passing hour. What by thy grace can foil the tempter's power? 
Maybe you're tempted to think you didn't make a difference. Who, by, like thyself, my guide and stay by me. So through cloud and sunshine, Lord, abide with me. Then the fourth verse is they're singing, I fear no foe. And they're well singers. They're singing out. This is the last song they're ever going to sing. I fear no foe with thee at hand to bless. Ills have no weight and tears no bitterness. Where is death sting? Where grave thy victory? All of a sudden they hear honk, honk, honk. Voices travel over water. And there was a rescue ship with a spotlight searching. They heard the voices and they came. And you can imagine they sang the last verse much differently. And so it's a wonderful promise. In life and death, good times or tough times, Jesus abides with us. Amen.